Welcome to the Canny Conversations podcast, conversations with a cause with social entrepreneur Safraz Ali. This week, Saf talks once again to Ninda Johal about why many startup businesses don't get beyond the nursery slopes and what qualities are needed to scale up. So let's join the conversation. It's that time uh, when I'm joined again by Safraz Ali. Hello, Saf. Hi, Adrian. How are you doing? Well, I'm very well, thank you. And why are we here, Saf? We are here to record a canny conversation with a cause. And what will that canny conversation do? We hope it will captivate our listeners' curiosity cannily. But it's not a wheat situation today, is it? Because we've got a very special guest, haven't we? Yes, we have. We have indeed. We've got Mr. Ninda Johal. And uh, the people in the UK, in the English Midlands, he doesn't really need any introduction. Um, for those who are not in the English Midlands... He's a business guru. I think that's the way Saf's described him, and he's not arguing, and neither should he. Um, he's a business guru. He's a magazine publisher, publishes the Business Influencer. Um, he is also the man behind the Signature Awards, which celebrates the best of business in our region. And he's a Deputy Lord Lieutenant. So uh, we're honoured, aren't we, Saf? Absolutely. And what we're going to do today, uh, Ninda, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction. That's all right. We'll the, we'll, 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 we'll we'll change. We'll swap brown envelopes with stuff <laughs> with money later on. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I meant every word of it, Ninda. Of course, I did. Um, we're going to talk about scaling businesses today. We hear a lot about startups, and my perception is that there's quite a lot of support available for businesses that are starting. Um, unfortunately, a lot of businesses that start don't succeed, and that's part and parcel of the way work, the world is. But but scaling a business and getting it to the next level um, is is essential, and it's something that Safraz has written about uh, in his books. It's something that 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 I know Ninda feels passionately about. So, gentlemen, in whichever order you wish. Why do so many startups fail? Shall I kick off? Please, please, Um Okay, for a number of reasons. Um, there's, this, there's this phrase, do what you love. Hmm. Uh, that's great, but you've got to make sure there's a market for it. And unfortunately, too many people uh, plow into marketplace believing that what they love, everybody else loves. Hmm. So, so that, I think that's, that's the starting point. I think the second point is education. And what I mean by that is, at schools, they're not taught finance. They're taught arithmetic, but no one's been taught the importance of finance, personal finance, and how to use finance. So I think a lot of businesses got bust in the first three years. One, through lack of market demand, back to what I'm saying. But secondly, what I call not knowing your numbers. And then they're not really fixated on understanding the importance of numbers. And, and behind numbers, you need something called assumptions. So you need to assume certain things will happen that will lead to numbers. Frequently, people throw themselves in there and forget to look at the numbers. And if, if, even if they do the know, know the numbers, are there, they hide under the table and think it'll all get resolved. So, so firstly, market concept. Secondly is numbers. And, and I think thirdly um, is the word endurance and resilience. And, and so too often, people give up before they should. And so, I, I mean, I'll give my examples. I spent, uh, I, I quoted this number recently, 4,572 days pursuing a dream. And that was to take Bhangra music, which is a fusion of Northwest Indian melodies with Western beats. And so I set myself a dream of selling this type of music, marketing it to the entire globe. Mm. Now, most people said it was rubbish, stupid idea. And I think partly now in hindsight, I do believe, I think they were probably right. But I, I had the resilience to keep going, keep going, keep, keep going. And entrepreneurship has ups and downs. And there are some dark moments, some real dark moments. And that's what makes or breaks you. And, and too many people don't have the resilience to see it through. And I think my final comment is somebody walks in and said, I have a plan A, B, C, and D, means they don't believe in plan A. And to believe in plan A, you have to give it Everything, and I mean everything, every sinew that you have, 
to make it work. So those are just some of the reasons, I'm not going to go into all the rest, but those are some of the reasons why some entrepreneurs, with or without an education, make billions and change the world. By the way, Jobs changed the world. Bill Gates changed the world, while others fall by the side and never realize the dream that that set out to do. And I can only say that dream com- wasn't compelling enough for them to see to the end. Absolutely. There's a lot of, lot of gems there. Uh, just talking from a little bit of experience, I mean, um, I've come across many startups that fail because the setup isn't right. So they, they, they go into partnership with a friend, with a colleague and so mm-hmm. forth. So they're not founded the right way. They're not founded with the right systems, uh, the legal documents and so forth. It's just a matter of let's go into business. So it's it's a bit too easy now to a certain level for people to get into business. And those tests aren't, aren't necessarily there. You can set up a company within a day. I've seen that yeah. domain with a day. And that's all you need really to a certain level. Mm-hmm. And people have done that. They've thought of something. Let's do it. Let's go now all this enthusiasm and sometimes there's nobody putting the brakes in and what happens is when they go and see advisors consultants uh, accountants most of them are trying to slow them down you know and and they're thinking that they're being negative because at the moment we're we're sort of glorifying um, you know, entrepreneurs were glorifying, you know, uh, the, the whole sort of, you know, you can go out there, set up a business and become a millionaire, billionaire within a period of time. So they start, uh, the, the focus isn't there. And what's happening is when somebody's talking to you to try and put a little bit of context in to talk about your skills and challenge you potentially uh, to start thinking about, you know, how, you, how you're going to go and get a customer, the first customer, then you know people think that that's being negative, and people uh, you know very quickly uh, start thinking about branding. They don't think about what well, who their first customer is going to be, how they're going to go and get customers. Their foc- their focus is well, I'll get a I'll get a website. I'll start you know they start doodling about you know logos. That's right. Start thinking about branding. Start that's thinking right. about you know Facebook setting up a Facebook page sure. and a LinkedIn page and all the rest of it but not necessarily who's going to be my first customer, what is my product, and am I going to get that first customer. As soon as they're able to sell to somebody and actually be in a position where they can retain that customer, you can then say, you know what, they're in a position to potentially grow. People don't even pass that stage. So they set the company up and it just dies. There's a lot of that. And unfortunately, it's sometimes they need that little bit of counseling, that a little bit of advice. Uh, and really getting that structure right in terms of what that looks like. We used to talk about, you know, you know, the structure of sole traders, partnerships, limited companies, and so forth. Nobody does that anymore. Uh, you know, you know, just very quickly set up a limited company. Uh, you know, share, you know, fifty fifty on shares. Not much, not not much in terms of thought, in terms of what would go wrong, how we, you know, and and those sort of things aren't necessarily there. And and and, and, yeah. and, and, and interesting, absolutely agreed. But if we go back 20, 30 years, yeah. the word mentoring didn't exist. Yeah, it no. exists now. Yeah. We didn't have a keyboard and a click that took us to Google to do <laughs> that market research. Yeah. So, in fact, we took greater gambles. Uh, we had less of a support structure than absolutely everything you've just said. And, and, and listen, big businesses have toppled over because they didn't get those partnership agreements in place. I'm going to talk big absolutely. businesses. Yeah. Family businesses have toppled over or have had to sell out to crystallize their gains because actually, as people, they couldn't cope. So absolutely everything, you're completely correct. And you know, some people don't even do basic research on Google just to find out who else is in the marketplace doing what they do. Absolutely. And do you, do you think it could also be because if somebody's good at something, they're a good technician, for example, you've got somebody who's a, <coughs> who's a very good mechanic. Yeah. But because you're a good mechanic doesn't necessarily mean you can run a successful... Absolutely. Garage, does it? Absolutely. So, so how much of it is about sort of that? Uh, someone once said to me that there are there are technicians, there are managers, and there are entrepreneurs, and they're not the same thing. Would you two subscribe to that view? Yeah, I mean, there's a book which is the E Myth uh, Revisited or E Myth, uh, Michael Gerber, which actually talks about that specifically. And 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 uh, as as Linda said earlier on, people think you know just because I've I've come across something that I love. This is my passion. That's enough. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not. You need the knowledge. You need skills. You need different traits. You need to be a bit of an all rounder, or at least, at the very least, you need to know what your what, what your weaknesses are, and you have to have a little bit of understanding of you know how you are as a person, 
and what makes you tick, what you know, what you know, what your strengths are. You can play to those strengths and have that understanding of really that you know, you know, what am I good at? What am I not so good at? And then really the then separately the the idea, the product that you've got, and does it work? And is this something that's marketable? Is this something that you know can grow? So there's a number of number of things there that I'll just add to that. But but but, but Saf, if I take you as an example, I mean you've grown a series of businesses, and it, it requires a mindset. It requires a certain mindset. So I'm in order of entrepreneurs. Because one, they took the challenge of going alone in the world. They've left behind a really well paid job. Then they have so once they've established, which itself is. Quite a nightmare just getting it going. I mean, we all remember our first sale yeah. because boom, <laughs> boom, I have a business here because somebody actually believes in what I've got. I've got a first sale. Yeah. Then there's, and I'm sure we're going to come to is then how do you then scale that? And that requires a totally different skill set, totally different skill set. And, and and of course, that then moves away from the technician to more of the coaching and the leading. And then, of course, you bring in managers as you delegate to them and then it's managing them and coaching them. So I'm in awe of people who build and have scaled businesses because they've gone through that iteration. And, and you're, you know, you're a shining example of someone who's built a business in multiple sectors and have managed to keep it growing and yet build an ecosystem around it. So well done you, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm completely in awe of entrepreneurs because of the very yeah. thing we're just yeah. saying. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think I think we've, we've got a scale-up issue at this point in time because a lot of businesses are started not many survive, you know. We've, you know, we've seen this facts, and it depends on who you listen to and the stats. You know, the, the you know, three years, five years, whatever mm-hmm. the case is. But, but after that, most still remain very sort of micro level businesses. And you know, it's how do you get to that position of scaling? And I'm not evangelizing scaling to say that's the only thing because there's people out there who you know who very want happy. to have a lifestyle business. They're, yeah, they're, happy. they're very happy with that. So it's not always about happy. growing for the sake of growing or you know yeah. scaling and so forth. And I know you know scaling has become a bit of a sexy word out there, but it's not all about that. People go into business for different reasons. For your the first reason for, when I'm talking to people is people want choice. And, and 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 either they feel frustrated at their workplace, and you said you know people take a risk, but it's either they feel the fact that you know something in their life happens. So if they're in a secure secure job, they feel uh, the fact that you know they've got more to offer. They want a different lifestyle, and it's that reason. It's not necessarily good to go out there and and uh, you know have uh, you know to make money for the sake of money. It's about choice per se. And it's with that choice that they look at, and people then will then think about over a period of time, you know, what you know, you know where their life is. And people' mind does change. Somebody, somebody could go in and say, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to employ a lot of people, or I want an international business or a global business. Some people might say, you know, I don't want to employ people, but people do change their minds. There's nothing wrong with that yeah. because we evolve. And and um, and that's just how it is. I mean, as I said, I didn't start off thinking the fact that I'm gonna be a business person of any kind or entrepreneur. I mean, these are these they, they, they were not something that I was thinking about. I wanted to go down a professional route because that's what my father sort yeah, of was taking. Right. I wanted to be, become a professional. I want to become. Uh, I want to be educated, which is what you know what what my drivers were originally, and then I felt the fact that you know I I, I managed to do some work and became a professional in my financial services field, but I just felt there was a void there, and I, and I wanted to do something different, which is you know why I've gone into the fields that I've gone into. I think into. you've both made a very good point there, in in so far as, um, you know, if someone is running a, a set up a business and it's running successfully, and it's giving them the lifestyle and the income that they want and they're happy they don't have to scale up um but let's 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 say they've decided they want to do that they want to see the business um grow let's talk about some of the support that's available and some of the um mindset and and the emotion that goes with that because i would Im- well I, if someone sets up a business um it's their baby and and Gentlemen, tell me if I'm right or wrong, but one of the inevitable consequences of scaling up, I guess, is that you have to let go to a degree. So you have to kind of like, you're like the mum who's letting the baby be looked after by somebody else or in part for a time. Um, you've both been involved, you know, in small businesses and made a decision to, to try and get bigger. But, you know, is that letting go? Of, that must be quite a 
difficult process. I, th I think um, I think with scaling, um, and, and, and Seth referred to it earlier, I think you need to get processes and systems in place. And what that means is that when you do delegate and let go of something, there's a system and a process to make sure that it can happen in your absence. And I think just relying on intuition and just relying on what you think you've told someone via communication isn't going to work. So I think as a business grows and as you delegate it becomes more complex, interpretation becomes a lot more complex, what he, who, he, she didn't say, and that's where processes and systems come into place. The perfect business really, and, and I'm, I'm sure we'll probably come talk about personal branding in a few minutes, the personal business is the one where the entrepreneur or the business owner can remove he or herself from the business and he can operate without them. That's when you've truly got a scalable business because then you can just scale it. But I think systems and processes are important. But I think before you even do that, I think there's a really important question to ask, and Saf's already referred to it, is why do you want to scale? Because once you understand why you want to scale, then you can put those systems and process in place to scale. But why is a very important question. And I think linked to why is your appetite for risk. How do you have measure that risk and, and then put the two together? Because a lot of business obviously in, a ten, in trying to scale, take too much risk and fail. And we've seen a lot of those businesses go under because they've taken too much risk. And, and I think finally... Um, and again, you referred to this earlier as well, Saf, is it's who you surround yourself with. And, 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 you know, if you are going to scale, you've done the why, the next question is how, and how's, how is someone or people around you going to help you to get there? And there's two types of things there. One is, and, and scaling means your, your role as an entrepreneur founder changes, because actually your role is no longer about running the business. Your role now becomes one of talent, talent acquisition, your job now is to find the talent that can fit your systems and processes and bring to bear your vision. So it becomes one of talent now. And, and there's one finite resource is talent. You can digitize everything, but you can't digitize talent. And I think that's where the scaling up becomes a problem. So businesses fail scaling for three different reasons. One, no systems and processes. People fall over. Secondly, being too risky and or being too risk averse. And thirdly, a big one is finance. Do you have the finance in place? Have you done the numbers to enable you to scale? And have you stressed your numbers? Have you done some financial stressing so that the risk is taken account of? And whether we have time to talk about governance is an issue, but that's where the governance comes in. And, and, and you can then determine your appetite for risk. But yeah, it's, it's ultimately, ultimately is down to mindset. Any, any thoughts, Seth? Any other additional thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just want to unpack some of the uh, the, the comments that Ninder has made, and just just uh, uh, just uh, again share share with you uh, uh, and agree with you some of the the thoughts that I, that, I, that I've got. Firstly, it is about control. <clears throat> you've got to be you've got to be in a position where, yeah, you, know, uh, you know, if you're a sole trader, if you're a small business owner. The book, you know, stops with you, as I say. You know, you've got to you've got to stop working on intuition. You've got to start getting looking at data, looking at the numbers behind it, and you know, start doing some what if analysis. It's not just a matter of I feel this morning I'm going to do this, this, this. You've got to put the brakes onto yourself to a certain level because sometimes what you find is uh, your traditional entrepreneur mindset is about I want it now, I want this going, and so forth. And they're, they're go getters. They're traditionally, and and to a certain level, they the they the you know they're the biggest biggest asset, but you know and they but they you know the biggest strength, but they can be the biggest weakness as well for a, for a business that's looking to scale up. So you've got to be in a position where how do I really look at myself in terms of what my strengths are? And, you know, the example, the best example that I, you know, that I tend to talk about is this Jim Shark in terms of Ben Francis. When when he made a decision initially, the fact that, you know, if I want to scale this business, I'm not the right person to do so. 
you know, so he got a CEO right. and he t- and he went down the route of a chief brand officer. He's changed his mind now in, right. because obviously he's gone through the process where, you know, he's ta- you know he's, he's looked at himself, he's evaluating, he says, you know, now I feel that, I, you know, over those three years that he's, he, you know, he's moved into a different position, now that I feel that I can be in that position where I'm the best person for the business in terms of CEO. So that's an example of somebody who's gone in themselves inward and looked at their skill sets, look at the way the business is going and thought, you know, now I'm the right person, but initially I'm not the right person because scaling requires systems, it requires processes, as Dinder said. It requires a certain level of discipline. And that discipline, sometimes as entrepreneurs, we're not used to. We're not used to people questioning us. We're not used to being in a position where we have accountability. We're not used to being in a position where the book doesn't always stop with us, stop with us because we have to relen- relinquish some of that control. We've got to we've got to have advisors around us. We've got to have people ar- around us who are who are there to support and guide us. Yes, you might still be the decision maker ultimately, but you've got to have the right team around you and build that power team. I, I, I think so. So one of the issues entrepreneurs have is they are so entangled with the brand they can't let go. And because they know every decision that's made, even further down, it comes back to them because they're the brand owners. They set it up. I'll give an example um, at the importance of brand and, and the allegiance of brand and the emotive nature of brand. So in other words, how you make wrong decisions because you're based on emotional attachment to the brand. So I was talking to a football club and um, one of the directors said, when we employ people, um, we first question we ask them, are you a football fan? connected with this football club. Mm. And if they say we are, we don't hire them. Because we think down that journey, they're going to make decisions based on not rational, yes. but based on emotion. Because they're so entangled with the brand. I don't know, it could be Aston Villa, West Brom, Man United, whoever, if I'm a Man United fan. And so the decision I'm going to make is not as a an employee of Man United, but as a fan. So, so I think that, and, and Sat's absolutely right, Entrepreneurs can be the best asset a business can have, but they can also be the biggest liability because of the emotional attachment to the brand that they've created. And it can be the hardest thing to think of. And so when I've talked to, through my pod, podcast, same name, uh, I've talked to people who've exited. And it's interesting. Some have no emotional attachment because they've run a few of them and said, oh, we just let it go. Mm. Uh, but some of them will tell you the day after they've sold it, they feel empty. And they suddenly feel they have no role in life. And that's why some of them then, within a few days, they're off again with the next challenge because their life is full of drive and challenge. So it's a complicated area, a very complicated area. But it's one that creates the most brilliant people that produce the most brilliant products and services that we as the rest of the world enjoy. So, so, so Seth and, and Linda, where should someone who, who decides they want to scale a business um, I mean, in your experience, the both of you, what sort of areas are people most likely to need help in? What's the best way of getting that help um, to make? Because I think the message that's come over loud and clear is that you know when you decide to scale, you're going to have to involve other people, and that talent is is desperately important. So, um, where where do people are most people most likely to need help, yeah. and how do they go about? about looking for it and, you know, what role are people like non-executive director has got to play? Okay. I'll start off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, just, just, just on that, I mean, the first thing is whenever, whenever a business is looking to scale up, they've got to look internally first. Have they got the management accounts coming in? You know, have they got the finances? Because that's just, that's your starting block, you know, are they getting the management monthly management reports? If you're not in a position where you're getting monthly management reports, and I've seen businesses which are fairly sizable, but they haven't got the infrastructure internally. So before you look outward in terms of advisors and so forth, is really what reporting mechanisms do you have? What reports do you look at? What data do you look at? What you know? How are you disciplined in terms of sales pipeline? How are you disciplined in terms of some of the numbers? What's your what's on your mind? As, a, as an individual, what are you, what, what data do you look at? And you start off with 
uh, numbers first, for account, you know, the accountancy element of it. And my biggest advice to, or my best advice in terms of, th- for those sort of businesses or people is look at either getting um, an outside accountant or talk to your accountants, look at, you know, a bookkeeper, to poor bookkeeper, or if you're, if you're able to, maybe a chief financial officer that can come in maybe on a, you know, on a couple of hours a month or whatever the case is that can go and explain the numbers to you and get into that discipline of understanding your numbers, understanding your management reports. Uh, you know, not everybody's an accountant like you could self. Uh, not everybody has the numbers in their mind. People, that's their pretty, pretty first weakness. And we, we've seen it all in Dragon's Den. Mm-hmm. You know, the ideas are there, the energy is there. It's the numbers that they fall on. So people, if they're not numerate in terms of numbers, if they're not number savvy, start with that first. Internally, before you start looking at any, anywhere externally. Um, in terms of um, uh, sort of uh, for, from an element of scalability or sort of support, the infrastructure is going to be absolutely key in terms of who you who you spend your time with. You know what 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 groups are you associated with? You know where do you go out to uh, to network? Who do you go and talk to? Uh, sometimes what you find is that you know they don't have that support mechanism. They don't have that. They apart from maybe having an accountant and the relationship with the accountant is just an element of a transactional relationship. Then you you know, they don't have that support mechanism. And it's really what your support mechanism is, who your go-to is, you know, you know if you're having a dark moment or if you're having an element of, you know, you, you feel you need to get bounce ideas, do you have a support mechanism? And this is where networking comes in. This is where mastermind coaches come in. This is where groups come in. This is where seminars, webinars, attending events per, come in. Because, you know, when you're going to these and you're exposing yourself and going out there, you know, uh, you're you're gaining from from the environment. You're gaining in terms of your mindset. You're 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 in a position where you're a bit more open. I think that's as a starting point. There's a, you know there's a lot there to talk about, but that's as a starting point. Can I bat that over now to yourself, Linda? Help us out here if you can. Yeah, no, no. So, so the first thing you said was processes yeah. and systems. Yeah. Um, and and know your numbers because when you go for further finance, whether it's debt or equity. Yeah. The first question they can ask is numbers, yeah. and and so whether it's Dragons Den or not, uh, numbers are important, and 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 again, you know, the why question comes in, and and how and what. So if you want to scale, why, and how do you scale, and what do you want to scale to, uh, and so th- these are questions that do come into place. Now this is where, and, and Saf's absolutely right. This is where the operational level of the entrepreneur now suddenly becomes strategic. And becomes a totally different market, a different place, and that's where now suddenly their focus isn't on nine to five. Their focus is going outside of nine to five, and starting to understand the whole environment in which they operate. Now, how do you understand that environment? Well, you can go to Google, you can read a business influencer, you can mm-hmm. talk to other people. But I think that's where, and you're absolutely right. That's where, and I scribble down networking, and, and that's where networking comes in because really. I, I say to people, when you network, uh, you want to be networking with people that want to have better than you, mm. are ahead of the game. And actually, you want to network with people that you may want to do business in five years' time. Mm. So in other words, you elevate yourself and start to think on their level. And I think that's where networking and I think education comes in now. You need to now start educating yourself. And of course, some people are quite natural at this. They just know what they want, how to get it. Um, but yeah, so ev- everything Saf said, I completely uh, And before endorse. we move on, Linda, one of the things I wanted to just capture was, because um, I know it's something that, that, that you do, um, what, what's the role of a non-executive director in a business? It, it's presumably somebody who's able to sort of helicopter and take a, a, a view, but without getting involved in, in the day-to-day op- operations and and both of you, how valuable are non-executive directors to their business? I think you first need to distinguish between an advisor, mm. a consultant, mm. and a non-exec. Different roles. Mm. So, example, if you thought you have a deficiency in marketing, mm. you pull in a marketing consultant stroke advisor who will then advise you how to do that. If, as Saf said, you feel your grasp of numbers isn't great, mm. you then pull in a a CFO or, 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 or somebody two days a week or mm. one day a month, whichever it is, that resolves that. Now, a non-exec director, and a lot of people are very confused by this, so so non-exec director came about 
was that when you sold your shares or you sold, sold bits of your business to external people, mm. as shareholders, they needed to make sure that their interests were looked after. Okay. So they would then appoint a non-exec director. So what that means is that director is not involved day-to-day, so non-executive, non, and they're there then to guide the business, but they are representing someone else. Now, some of them could be representing themselves because mm-hmm. they're a shareholder, but they're not involved in day-to-day. So that was the traditional model. And, of course, what you now have is you have a lot of social enterprises, mm-hmm. a lot of enterprises that seek money from the public. And and what the people who are putting money in will probably say before they do it is, well, actually, I just want to check, how do you, what's the stewardship function of your business, in other words, your charity or whatever it is? Who's the one questioning what you're doing with our money? And that's where the word trustee, non-exec director comes in, because actually they're representing stakeholders who have a vested interest either in that business that social enterprise or that charity. Now, what does a non-exec director look like? Well, it depends on the business. It depends when they do a skill set mapping exercise. Well, actually, executive-wise, we've got the right people, but on the board, the people who are going to scrutinize what we say is true. Do we have the right requisite skill set? And if we're missing an accountant or a lawyer or somebody in human resources, you parachute them in. And their job is to scrutinize and help and assist and support the executives, the people who run day to day. Uh, not every business needs a non-exec. They're quite happy to just bring a consultant in or, a, or an advisor in. You've really got to understand what a non-exec does. And the non-exec needs to know what their role is when they become a non-exec. Because the problem I see at close hand, because I've shared quite a few of these things, is that some of the non-execs think they're actually operational. Mm-hmm. And they start to meddle with operational day-to-day, what then happens is the, the execs who are supposed to be doing that, they get disillusioned and before you know it, the whole thing implodes. Mm. And I won't go into the whole shebang, but that's where the role of a chair is to have that balance. I hope that's, I hope yeah, that's clear. clear. I mean, Nindra is obviously an expert in the whole governance and non-executive market. He's a judge for the uh, for, for the uh, Sunday Times uh, uh, non-executive awards, uh, but also a governor uh, for, for many institutions and a chair and a... And a and, a, and and has expertise in that, and has seen it all, and seen issues within boards, seen issues with, with with uh, C level people, and and uh, you know the the conflict and the issues that, that arise, and 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 as you rightly said, Ninda, there's a confusion in terms of what what it what it means, what an executive means. Uh, and and there's also confusion. Just similarly, like you know, we've we've got with the you know what what is a business? What is what is what's a mentor? What's a coach? You know, the yeah. word interchangeably is used. Um, you know, people. You know, what what's a trainer or an assessor in our field? You know, the world. You know, teacher or a trainer. These are interchangeable. Uh, but they have a specific meaning. And, and as you said, sometimes it's about going out and getting expertise, technical expertise, like you mentioned earlier on, uh, Adrian. And sometimes it's about getting holistic support and, and getting you know uh, somebody who who is there to often uh, just, uh, uh, you know, it's about challenge and support yeah. and getting the li- level, right level of challenge and support. It's not always about uh, challenging for the sake of challenging or putting brakes on, but it's asking the right questions in the right way at the right time and, and getting you to think, and and plan better and and really uh, question yourself. We sometimes we find it hard to to do so. Well, I, I've lost uh, the number of times people ring me <laughs> and say, "Can you be a non-exec?" And I said, "Well, okay. So why do you need a non-exec?" And they said, "Oh, oh we want to push our sales." I said, "No, no. You need a yeah. salesman. Yeah. You don't need a non-exec. You need a salesman." So a lot of people don't actually understand. I'm, I want to say we've got lots of non-execs. Actually, no, no, no. I, I think as our time does draw to a close, I think I just want to sort of. What I've picked up from this, there are a number, so many things that I've picked up, but one of them is, you know, if you want to, if you're going to scale, you need to understand why you why you want to scale. The second thing I picked up is the importance of recognizing where your deficiencies are and where you really need need the help. And the third point that that that, that you made, Ninda, was this business about trying to to to, to as far as possible take the emotion out of it. Mm. You talked about the, the football team. So just in the closing couple of minutes, I want to just ask your thoughts in terms of a lot of businesses are family businesses. Mm. 
Um, some bi family businesses, you know, grow to be very successful. Um, how do you take the emotion out of a family business? I mean, if you want to grow a family business, it, it, it's not easy to say, um, sorry, son, I'm going to have to let you go. But shall we go and have a bag of chips and watch a football match together? So, <laughs> I mean, how would, would you both think that agree there is a, a particular problem with that uh, okay, family so, business? So, 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 so I, I can speak on this and I'll, I'll explain. Well, firstly, uh, I asked Joe Foster the same question because what he did was um, he, he, he walked into a business run by his father and he wasn't happy the way he was, his father was running the business, who incidentally was in partnership with his brother. Mm. It gets complicated. Um, and his brother, so his father and his brother didn't get on. So he, here's the problem. So then he had to leave the business, the family business, and set up by himself with his own brother. And I said, well, hold on. You you sort of set your brother get, to your dad. We'll get lost. I'm, I'm off. But yet you set up with your brother. So, so I think the answer was that it can work, and sometimes it doesn't work. The advantage of it working is that you all share the same vision, hopefully. You're all heading in the same direction. The problem becomes that people change over time. And listen, I've, I've managed bands and artists, and they believe me, they change over time. People change over time. It's back to your earlier comment about having things in writing. That's the non-emotional bit of it. Um, so that's where most people fall. Um, it gets even more complicated when the person who you've gone into business, be it a brother or uncle, they then get married. Where does that person fit in? It gets even more complicated when they have children. Where do they fit in? And each, with each generation, are you sure they've got the same vision as you have? What are they looking to get from the business? Are they looking for a dividend? That's, in other words, a percentage of the profits. Do they want to be involved? Don't they want to be involved? There's no straight answer to any business. Now, I incidentally, and the reason why I said I can talk about this, my wife works with me in the business. My son works with me in the business. And my daughter's school has already professed she wants to join the business. And I'm already thinking, oh, great. But having now learned from other people, and that's a very good point you made, Saf, earlier, is learn from other people, is I've got to make sure the structure's set up properly. I've got to make sure expectations are managed properly so that this thing, should and one day I decide not to do it, I can pass it on. But remember, there's always the non-emotional bit, which is, actually, it's not right for you, son, daughter. I think someone else should do it. That's a very difficult conversation to have. And it's how you manage the expectations with each generation and to make sure they understand whether they want to be in or out and how to manage. Some people have been quite upfront with me and said, the last thing you should do is involve family members. They told me straight. They said, no, no, you and your wife are in it and then decide whether you want to pass it on. Yeah, I think we've both seen both sides of it where, you know, the, the founders, they, they have decided the fact that they they don't want their children to come into their business because they want them to go out and, and do their thing. And sometimes the children also feel the same. Yeah. And in other cases, they want them to come into the business. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's all sorts. And a lot of it, I think, starts with, uh, I think from my perspective, it depends on the, the game, you know, where the business is going, you know, what the ambition is for that business. Yeah. And, you know, a founder at the end of the day is a founder. And sometimes, you know, they, you know, they do their things in a different particular way. And it's hard to in let go, relinquish uh, control. It's also about roles and responsibilities. You know, are they very easy, you know, clearly defined? You know, are job descriptions done? Are contracts done? What you find in some businesses that, you know, they've got, they, they, they've got people in, but the, the, there's no contract of employment. The, you know, the, the paperwork isn't there. There's no organization chart. Uh, decision making isn't very uh, the, the, uh, easily defined. Um, conversations about the business are happening in the car or in the corridor or whatever the case is. And, you know, there's no structure to it. And what you find is that when there's no structure, it becomes a bit harder. So there's always, you know, there's always different aspects of it. When it works, it works really well. And and when it doesn't, it can work pretty, pretty bad I, as well. Um, so. I, I, I remember asking uh, Srinda Aurora, who's yeah. worth about 1.2 billion. So I said to him, would you ever sell? And he didn't hesitate. And while he replied, he looked straight at the sun and he said, why would I want to sell? And at the same time, he looked straight at his son when he replied. Mm. So <laughs> that's either you're taking it on, my friend, or not. But he was straight, didn't hesitate. He said, no, I would never sell. He said, why would I sell? Mm. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think, I think uh, I, I, it depends on the individuals, and I, right. think, I think I think we, we've seen cases where families have have gone to court, have gone to yeah. you know, and and there's big, big, uh, you know, high profile cases where you know, um, you know, uh, I'm, I don't, don't want to name any names, no. where, where somebody's on a, in a wheelchair going into into a court, and it's a family battle over a. You know, in particular, the hotel industry in this example yeah. that I'm thinking about. But there's many other examples where, yeah. you know, where, where, where it's happened and it can divide families and it gets complicated because people are complicated and people do change and 100%. people view, view change, views, views change. And, 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 and if, if you ask uh, even two founders in terms of where the business is going, you'd you probably get different answers. And, and I, I think my final comment on it, you just talked about emotion. So, so there's a school of thought which says, Never pass the business on. Sell it to the next generation. Mm. Sell it. Actually, say I want this much. My God, how would that conversation go in terms of determining <laughs> price? Absolutely. Anyway. Absolutely. 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 I, I mean, it's been a pleasure, hasn't it? Um, I mean, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge, and, and knowledge based on experience. And mm. there's nothing wrong with book learning. I think you agree with that. But but there's nothing quite um, as valuable as an experience. So uh, you're incredibly grateful, aren't we? And privileged to have had Ninda help us with this podcast. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I had the uh, honour and the privilege to go on to Ninda's podcast a little while back. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I thank, for, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about my next article for the Business Influencer. That's right. And maybe this is a topic that you allow yeah, me to, yeah, you, absolutely. To, 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 to write for as well. So thank you so much for, for your so, time. So much to talk about. And maybe, you know, conversations to be continued Another day, um, but not today, because it's time now to curtail our canny conversation with a cause. To thank our listeners, to say if there are any questions or any feedback, do let us know. Um, if you feel that you'd like to like us uh, and subscribe, we would like um, that ourselves. It'd be great. Uh, and until the next time, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>